very warm welcome to everyone from Vienna. My name is Jean-Robert Tiran. I'm a professor of economics here at the University of Vienna, and it is my pleasure to say a few words of introduction to today's event on behalf of the Vienna Behavioral Economics Network, or VBAN for short. The purpose of the VBAN is to bring together top academics with business people and policy makers, and essentially anyone who has an interest to discuss insights from behavioral and experimental economics. Our focus is not merely academic, but it is on how behavioral and experimental economics contributes to improve decision-making in business, society, and the state. We normally meet in attractive locations here around Vienna to reach out to non-academics, to mingle, to network, and to have a drink after the talks and the discussions. Unfortunately, the coronavirus and the social distancing that comes with it has killed that concept. And in thinking about how to react to the new situation, we decided to go digital, which provided us with the opportunity to reach out to people outside of Vienna and to talk to eminent economists who are sitting somewhere else on this planet. The COVID crisis also induced us to experiment with the format. Today, we have eminent economist Paul Romer sitting somewhere in the United States, and he's being interviewed by Professor Nora Seich, who is sitting in Germany. Let me say a few words about Paul Romer. He's an eminent economist, of course. He's currently professor at the NYU in New York, and he's a policy entrepreneur in many guises. He has been the chief economist of the World Bank, is the founder of a successful startup company dedicated to increasing student effort and classroom engagement, and he advises the US government, for example, on matters of antitrust, but just last week he spoke to the House Budget Committee. He has been named one of the 25 most influential Americans by Time magazine in 1997. Among economists, he is, of course, very well known for his contributions to understanding economic growth. Paul was the first to integrate ideas and innovations into economic models of growth. And for that achievement, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences in 2018. Today, Paul Romer will speak about the economic and potentially other costs of the corona crisis. And he will also explain, I hope, how a second lockdown can be avoided. Paul has indeed been very insistent in arguing that massive testing is the right way forward, even if this means billions and billions of dollars spent on testing, because this is still much cheaper than a second lockdown. Nora Seich is a star behavioral and experimental economist of the next generation, and she is currently a professor in Karlsruhe, Germany. She has very successfully published on morality and the marketplace and on ethical consumption. Her work is original and thought-provoking, and it has received a lot of attention in the media. She has therefore been named among the top 40 under 40 in the category Society and Science by the German magazine Capital. We are very happy to have Nora with us today because she has recently published a working paper on testing for the coronavirus, and testing will, of course, be one of the main topics of today's event. Indeed, we hope that this event will motivate you to sign a manifesto, a manifesto that urges governments around the world to engage in widespread and regular testing. Paul Romer, Nora Zech, and many others, including myself, have already signed the manifesto, and we hope that you will go to testtheworld.org to express your support for the cause. It is extremely important to us to involve the audience in the discussion. So please participate and write your questions and comments to Paul Romer in the chat while the interview is going on or afterwards. 
all that remains is to express my gratitude. Many thanks to Paul Romer for being with us today. Many thanks to the people from Fair Advice who have organized everything and made this event technically possible. And many thanks to Nora Seich for hosting the event. Many thanks to all of you. And with these words, I hand over to Nora calling Germany. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start as this is also the header of the event. Um, what situation are we in right now? How does it compare to the yeah. Great Depression? Yeah, you know, um, if, if I may, um, I, I'd like to just have a preface uh, that occurred to me as I was listening. Um, the, the Behavioral Economics Network is part of a new trend in economics, which has been asserting the importance of evidence relative to theory. My contribution has been mainly as a theorist. And the, in economics, we tended to give a little too much weight to the, to the kind of pronouncements of the theorists. What theory can do is suggest possibilities, but it's only evidence collected through experiments, collected however, that can actually tell us what's true. And you know, economics is going through a, a, a kind of switch towards re-emphasizing the importance of what I, what I call the, the principle that a fact beats a theory every time. Now, I, I wanted to start with this because it's part of the setting and the, the connection to the group, but it's also very relevant to the problems we've had managing the, the coronavirus. I think we have too many people in public health and epidemiology who are still operating based on theories, and they're not adapting to new evidence that, that comes in. And so this will be a, a theme that runs through the, the conversation uh, today. So with that preface, let me now then turn to your, your question about the economy. Um, the economic situation in many parts of the world is recovering uh, nicely. The United States is the big outlier amongst developed countries. Um, we're, uh, we had a sharp downturn a uh, sharp recovery that is now stalling and may actually go into another uh, another downturn. So uh, a month ago, uh, the, our Congressional Budget Office was forecasting that it would take until 2028 to get back to where we would have been in the absence of this pandemic. Um, given the resurgence of the virus and then the natural pulling back that individuals will do anyway, but that policymakers are also enforcing, um, it, it's quite likely that we're going to be even further behind schedule on this. So we're looking at a really prolonged, uh, slow economic recovery from a very sharp shock. And the message that underlies what I've been saying is, is that we can't fix the economy until we have a clear plan for fixing uh, the pandemic and bringing it under control. Um, just because you... Um you spoke about this uh, mathiness that you may have in, in economics, right? Yep. Um, it, it, but it, it's interesting you say that it also seems to exist in other fields, because I remember in the beginning of this, there was uh, always these uh, scientists who said, look, I tried to calibrate my model, but somehow the parameters, they do not fit. The models were not very suited to where we are in. And, and, and this virus turns out to be different from the most recent viruses we've addressed because there's this large fraction of transmission that takes place before people have symptoms. So things like contact tracing, which rely very heavily on the presence of symptoms as a trigger for various actions, um, are not working as well with, with this virus. And what's troubling has been the, the failure of the system as a whole to take on board that new information and to say, okay, given what we know now, how will we adjust to have a successful uh, approach? I think countries that were pragmatic and were willing to use trial and error um, and iterate quickly managed to contain the pandemic at earlier stages uh, in its spread and everything gets harder about controlling it when it spreads farther. What's striking is the two countries that we expected to be best prepared for handling a pandemic. The UK and the US have really been some of the worst performers. And I think it's because 
the the academic um, kind of uh, heavy hand uh, from our well-developed uh, you know, academic centers on, uh, on public health slowed down that process of adapting to the new information and trying something else. I see. Do, do you also feel that expectations and, you know, what we experienced in the past mattered? Because at least in Germany, we had very much this like, oh, you know, this will be like SARS-1 in the end. And while yep. other countries were hit hard in Asia and so on, in Germany, it was like nine cases in total. So people were super relaxed at that. So there was some complacency. That's, that's hard to avoid. If you haven't experienced something that's so shocking and so damaging so quickly, it's hard to believe it's really possible. So complacency, you know, was a kind of almost very difficult to avoid problem in places that hadn't experienced a real pandemic recently. But, um, but it's, the, it's the persistence of the same policy response in the face of evidence that it's not working, which I think is the more, uh, the more serious problem. But the thing that I think we can fix if we learn the right lessons from this episode and um, apply them going forward. And, and just to reiterate, we need to just an essential element of the science and the policy application of science has to be this principle that a fact beats a theory. Your theory may be pretty and lovely and mathematically elegant, but if it doesn't fit the facts, the facts win and your theory needs to be set aside. Couldn't agree more on that. Um, so how do we get out of this crisis? How do we cure the problem that is at the source? Yeah, well, so I think it's worth distinguishing the case in the United States where we've got a very high prevalence. Um, rough orders of magnitude, there are about 200,000 people who get infected every day in the United States. We've got millions, two million, two million plus people who are currently infected. At that scale, options are different. In other parts of the world where the prevalence is very low, Things like contact tracing can work. You get a little outbreak, the government can quickly marshal contact tracers, go out and find all of the people who've been uh, you know, touched by someone who was infectious. Contact tracing, tracing can work in conditions of low prevalence. It doesn't work at the level of prevalence we have in the United States right now. So there were two thoughts about this. One idea was to roll out the digital contact tracing because that might scale better than the human contact tracing. I think this was another case where theorists were pushing this idea and not paying attention to the facts. And the facts were that many, many people are suspicious of technology. They've been burned by pronouncements about how their privacy will be protected, which turned out not to be true. Um, they're suspicious of government. They're suspicious of the tech firms. So this digital contact tracing app idea, um, I think, was just doomed from the start. And it it slowed us down from uh, adopting some other measure that, that would work. And as I've suggested, the, 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 the key here is to find the small percentage, you know, less than 1% of the U.S. population or any population that's infectious, and then to isolate them. So instead of putting restrictions on what everybody can do, find the people who are infectious, isolate them, put the restrictions on them, then you get the benefits of ongoing economic activity for everybody else and really mild restrictions for a short period of time for the people who are infectious. But the thing it takes to execute on this policy is a commitment to do enough testing to find them and to keep finding them because you know new, um, new sources of infection will, will come in. But um, uh, we just have to commit that this is a different approach for this virus in this context in the United States, but it's an entirely you know, feasible one. It's one that fits the facts. And it's the one that ultimately, I'm, I'm confident the US will do it eventually because nothing else is going to work. But uh, it, you know, the, the, it would be a lot better if we do it sooner rather than later. Oh yeah, I mean, as, as many deaths as we can prevent, right? Um, yeah. 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 Of course. And, and, you know, as many in educational careers that are interrupted right now, I mean, the, the deaths are only part of the cost. There, there are some kids' uh, educational careers that will never recover from the interruption of their schooling. They won't go back to school. They won't complete high school. Um, this is just a, an inevitable, you know, result of this. And it's going to be costly in their lives and costly for the nation. So you 
you're suggesting that um, basically everybody should get tested, right? Um, in, in the US from time to time and on a yep. quite regular basis, actually, right? Yep, yep. So, and, and I'm not alone in this. For example, Harvard has said that they're going to start by having students back on campus this fall. Universities are potentially dangerous because they could be the source of these super spreading events. So they're gonna start with just uh, a fraction, I think it's 40% of the student body on campus, and they're going to test people on the way in and test them every three days in, in the beginning. Now over time, if they find that with the every three day test, there are very few new infections that are coming in and they're picking up, they may scale that back every five days, maybe even every, every two weeks. But um, they're, they're committed to this idea that it's so much more important to keep people who are infected out of the community that they can afford to just pay themselves for the tests at this kind of frequency. And, and Harvard's not alone. Princeton's doing this. Um, uh, Cornell is doing it. Um, the Stanford Medical Center used this as a way to, to reopen. So we need to take this, this approach of, of mass testing that's going to be available to the elite institutions with the resources to do it on their own. We need to get the government to back it so it's available to everybody. Yeah, I mean, if you think about a student dorm, you can very easily imagine how this disease can easily spread, right? Oh, oh no, it's not the student dorm, it's the student party. Speaking yeah. loudly, you know, dense, packed densely, you know, parties, bars, they're, they're just like, you know, the perfect conditions for a super spreading event. Um, so in, in May, we went to the U.S. and we asked the representative people of grown-ups, um, would you want to get tested? Now, in, in that case, we, we asked about antibody testing, and this is a different right. story, and, and it's possibly more to assess better what is the potential immunity status in the society. Yeah. But, but what we see is that uh, one in five people say they don't want that, even if it's for free. They just don't want to do it. And um, the same seems to be true for hypothetical studies because we don't have a vaccine yet. Um, but there mm -hmm. is one in five people who say, I don't yeah. want a vaccine. And I could imagine when it comes to these tests for active infection, you may see a similar number, like one in five who says, no, thank you, yep. I don't care. <laughs> so how, how would you tackle these problems? Yep. I, I, I think it's, this is a very important point, and it's, it's good that you've already done the research on this and are flagging this for people. And I think you're exactly right that this is a big issue we're going to face with the vaccine as well. So that this idea that we're, we're just, the vaccine will come in and then boom, we'll have solved the problem is just much too uh, optimistic and I think naive. Um, you know, one of the things we can do here is reassert the importance uh, for every person to think about the well-being of others. There's an extreme selfishness, which is ultimately very destructive to society. And we need to not just say this, but we need to show it. It's like what they say about good writing, show, don't tell. So what they're saying at Harvard is, if you want to be a student on campus, you have to agree to be tested with this frequency because this is essential for protecting everyone else. And if you're not willing to agree to this, you can be a remote student, but you can't be on campus. I think that's the kind of message we need to send to students in college. We need to send to students who uh, want to uh, want to go back to school, to parents who want their children to go back to school. And by the way, reinforce the message that's part of the law. Your kids have to be vaccinated too before they, they come to school. And, and we're going to face a very interesting question when we get to the point where we have to ask, should we add the vaccine for, the, you know, for this virus to the list of required uh, vaccinations for kids to attend school? But what's What's missing, and I think what your line of work about norms and values is, is so critical for, is an effort to reassert for everyone the importance of thinking about the well-being of the, the community, not just themselves. There's a, there's a saying in the US Navy where they tell the, the new members, uh, the new sailors, here's what you have to think about. Ship, shipmate, self. Your first job is to protect the ship. Your second job is to protect your shipmates. The third job, and only after you've done those first two, your job is to protect yourself. We need to send that message to all members of modern society. We're all part of a ship. We all have some obligation. That's a, it's a moral, ethical obligation to protecting the ship 
and the, the kind of the celebration of selfishness that has undermined that kind of moral commitment has done great harm, and we need to both show and tell that we need to reassert that obligation to uh, protect the ship. So we, we would aim for social heroes instead of the Trump warriors. So I remember Trump called people warriors, that they should just yeah. go out, uh, get infected, not care about that so much, and keep the economy going. No, 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 no. That's uh, <laughs> that's that's not that's not that's kind of like um, there was a famous exchange where um, some some U.S. general said, um, "I don't want soldiers who are going to go out and die for uh, their country. I want soldiers who are going to go out and you know make the other side die for for their their country." So, like these warriors are the kind who are just going to go out and sacrifice yourselves. That's not what you want in a military. You want a military which is going to protect itself and protect the nation and really think about it. like we got to protect the ship i was also wondering you know if this is uh, going to be stretched out and every u.s citizen gets tested regularly it means we need a huge amount of, of testing so so yeah. how yeah. how can we get there what would be the best like market yeah. solution for that or so what do you have in mind yeah so um this is a good question and and it's it's a it's a somewhat complicated answer the most natural way to think about doing more of something is just scale up what you're doing. And that actually will not work. What we're doing is we have a system where we do these tightly regulated, very expensive, very precise, quote, clinical diagnostic tests that have to go through a very rigorous process of approval by our Food and Drug Administration. Um, they cost about $100 per person. They're part of the medical care system. They can, you know, when somebody gets these, one of these tests, it's recommended by a doctor, gets reimbursed by the, the, the health insurance system. We need a whole new class of tests, a screening test, which you can apply very broadly in the population. And its characteristics have to be, it's low cost because we're going to have to do it frequently. It also has to have results that are uh, available very quickly. If it takes five days to get the results from the test, you may as well have not bothered because within five days, the person will no longer be infectious or they'll have a big case of symptoms and you isolate them based on the symptoms. So the tests have value for finding and isolating only if you can act on them very quickly. Now, there are a couple of promising new ways to get these quick, uh, quick turnaround tests. Um, one is to bring university laboratories into the testing business, uh, but not in competition with the existing clinical diagnostic providers, into this, um, this kind of screening testing business. This is what Harvard will do with its own laboratories for its own students. This is what Cornell will do for its own students. But we need to have a legal framework where um, these services could be provided by a university like Harvard or MIT. They have a Broad Institute that can do this. The Broad Institute needs to be able to provide that to the Boston public schools, for example. And right now, the regulatory structure doesn't, doesn't allow that. Um, we second need a flexibility that will bring in things like pooling. When you run a, a test tube through the machine, that could have samples from 10 people instead of one person. If that tube says, if you find out there's virus in that tube, you can go back and test um, all 10 people to see who, you know, who was the one who was infectious. Pooling could speed up the throughput. But right now, the, the FDA has been a bottleneck to limit the, uh, the use of our existing capacity with, with pooling. Um, so bring in the university labs, use methods like pooling, use methods like saliva collection methods instead of swabs, which are more convenient, less costly, um, and just as, just as effective. But in addition, there's two other kinds of tests instead of the centralized lab tests. There are point of care tests, that name comes from the idea of you, you'd use them in a doctor's office. Uh, but think of them as like what you could do in a school building rather than uh, often a university lab building. Uh, and then there's home testing. There are several promising new technologies being developed by a bunch of firms to do point of care testing. Uh, there are devices to now do true PCR testing at point of care, like a PCR machine that used to be bigger than like three washing machines People have miniaturized this so it's like the size of a briefcase. So you could have a PCR machine in every school. 
Um, there's another kind of molecular test method based on what they call an isothermal approach, where instead of cycling the temperature up and down many times, you just maintain it at a constant temperature. It's a little easier to set up. It's not quite as sensitive as PCR, but still very good. Um, and then there are these antigen tests, which test for uh, uh, whether there's some, some, some aptamers, they call them, that bind to sites on virus particles. So if you see the binding, these tests will tell you, uh, okay, there are virus particles there. Again, they're not quite as sensitive as the molecular tests, but they might be cheaper and they might be able to give us even faster results than those tests. So some mixture of the PCR, the isothermal molecular and antigen testing should make it possible within the building in a school uh, or a workplace to get results about who's, you know, who's potentially uh, uh, infectious, you know, within, you know, within 15 minutes. Wow. And this will rapidly speed up our ability to, um, uh, to respond. And this gets back to kind of my, what my theory kind of was trying to suggest as a possibility, that if you create incentives, firms will innovate. They'll find ways to do things. And also, it isn't just for-profit firms, university laboratories have been very innovative. That was a university lab, not a commercial lab that developed um, uh, the saliva testing. So if we create the right incentives for innovation, we can get a solution to this problem of how do we test everybody frequently at, at acceptable cost. That sounds indeed promising. I, I read that Frankfurt Airport, they set up a, a testing site because, you know, if you want to travel to Greece, for example, then it's better you know whether you carry this virus or not. Because yep. if you carry it and Greece finds out, they're going to test many who go in, uh, yep. you end up in quarantine there. And this is not so pleasant if you are a tourist or so a business traveler. Um, but there you still have to wait for hours to get the results. Yeah. In 15 minutes, I mean, that, that would be super amazing. Yeah, this, this shows why the, the speed is so important. And, and there's some good modeling which shows that we should be willing to accept a little bit less sensitivity if uh, what it, it means is you get answers in 15 minutes instead of in, you know, in four hours. Yeah. Um, how has it been the last month? So... Um, I guess all of us have seen President Trump's reactions towards wearing masks, but also towards testing. I think we even have a small video there that maybe we can play now. Here's the bad part. When you test, of, when you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. You know, um, uh, People in government are, are a little more worried than usual about doing the wrong thing and getting, you know, barked at. Uh, so so it, it is unfortunate that people are more hesitant. At a time when we should be innovative and aggressive, government officials are hesitating. Um, but um, there's a pretty clear consensus amongst members of Congress in both the Republican and Democratic parties that um, testing is the thing that will work Testing is something we will back. I think there's a good chance that the Congress will pass new legislation before the end of July that will allow uh, allocate 75 billion in additional funding for for testing, and and the the president is in some ways a little bit like a um, uh, you know the the child who complains about having to you know eat eat his vegetables. Uh, where you just have to say we're going to eat our vegetables anyway, but you know we just have to put up with the the, the complaining. And know. interacting with other scientists, I mean specifically from other fields. You come from economics. Now you interact with many people from totally different backgrounds, like health backgrounds. How mm -hmm. is that? Well, um, it, it's it's been it's been interesting. Um, it was because I was very conscious of this issue of theory which had too much authority relative to facts and economics. I was sensitive to this when I entered into these new uh, disciplines and was kind of struck at how the same problem shows up there. I, I think there's, there's something, you know, we give way too much credit to somebody who says in effect, okay, I've written down um, some assumptions and from these assumptions I can prove if those assumptions are true, then X is Uh, X will follow. Um, you can assume anything you want. You can then get a logical inference that anything you want will, will happen. Um, there, there are some mathematical models, for example, which say 
that with some assumptions, um, if we just let the virus spread through the population, it will stop spreading when we get to like just 20% of the population. I mean, you can assume that. I, you know, I could write down assumptions where it'll stop at 1%. You know, I, I, there's no big surprise in how you do this. But the facts show we're already above 1% have been infected. So that one's not true. And we need to ask, is there, are there any facts to make you think that it's really going to stop at 20%? I don't see any facts to, to justify that. So uh, what we got to go with is the facts. And in tight communities, like, you know, like ships that, uh, where we've seen this virus spread, a lot of people are going to get this virus if we just let it, let it spread. So um, I think there's a little bit too much deference given to, to theory compared to fact. Um, I, I think there's also been this kind of rigidity um, that partly comes from having academics get into a mode that I call preaching. They're kind of preaching to the public, here's what you should do. You know, in some ways, I think some of them are, are trying to think about addressing the, you know, the normative questions that we alluded to a minute ago. But the problem is, is that, that when somebody is in preaching mode, they stop listening. And so if, if I preach at somebody and they preach back, um, we don't listen to the arguments the way we should in science. And I say, you know, what I should say, is, oh, I see, you think I'm wrong about this. Well, let's see, is this because one of us has made an error in our logic or are we looking at different facts? If we're not preaching, if we're just trying to figure out what's true. We listen and we learn and we update. But too many academics have been saying, well, we have kind of decades of experience, and so I'm going to preach about what the public should do or what policymakers should do. And, and that preachiness, uh, combined with deference to the theory, um, has meant that I think the academic community has been too slow to recognize this virus is different, and it needs a, a different response. And also, we've got new possibilities now. These tests could be a lot cheaper than they, they, they were in the past. So, um, you know, this has been, any good healthy scientific community has vigorous discussion. And so I've been part of some vigorous discussions. Um, the way to judge if these are right is not whether people's, people feel happy after they have these discussions or everybody feels, you know, uh, like they're all, you know, <laughs> you know, they don't want to sing around the campfire together. The, the test of whether these discussions work is, are we converging on the facts, which we can then use to, to, to do a better job? And, and just to reiterate, the facts for this virus are that there's a lot of asymptomatic transmission, and a lot of that transmission happens through uh, the air in ways uh, that can linger for, you know, for hours mm -hmm. in poorly ventilated spaces. And if we just ignore those facts, we're not going to adopt policies which, um, which stop the spread of this virus. And if you're going to have poorly ventilated spaces where people spend hours, the only thing that's going to work is to test people first and don't let them in if they're infectious right now. Yeah, this is amazing, right? I mean, the stickiness that you describe for the scientists, um, I feel, but at least, you know, they come up with new results and, and challenge our ideas about this virus because I feel the stickiness in policy making, at least in Germany, when we look into all these rules, how to limit the spread and so on, uh, mm -hmm. the, the fact that this is airborne is, is, is really ignored. Yeah. We don't yeah. have it in any of the rules. It's just, you know, you keep your distance and then it's fine. Yeah. And, and, and this actually starts to corrupt the science, because if you look at the WHO, it was very slow to just admit what the evidence was showing us about airborne transmission, um, because they were worried about the, the policy implications. That what that would mean is that the six-foot rule is not enough in poorly ventilated spaces. I, if you're committed to the science and the facts, you just say, well, it may be an awkward fact, but it's a fact. And so we just have to, we have to acknowledge it. And I think both the WHO and the CDC have been shading the, the presentation they make of the facts to fit the kind of decisions that they've made or that they want to make. And, and this is undermining the, the credibility of, of, of science. So we need a vibrant community of uh, people like us who are willing to say, Uh, we're going to talk about the evidence and we're going to talk about what we think is true. And then we're going to figure out how we respond, uh, given what we think is true.
I will ask one final question, but it's okay. one that I've been really worried about and I would love to, to know about your perspective on that. Because um, we see what's happening in the US and uh, we see this also in our data that somehow um, the, the trust into the social stability, it, it seems to go down so much. And, and it seems to be that we are at a level now that is really, you know, it's, it's really indicating non-stability. And then people seem also to expect that even after Corona, this, this non-stability may, may remain. Um, what, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think this is, the, this is the big unresolved issue that we have to confront once we've, we've gone through the, the critical first steps, which are contain the pandemic, help economies recover, but then we have to look carefully at the social fabric. And after the financial crisis, we saw this surge in populism that I think was exacerbated by the financial crisis. This crisis is economically worse. It could have equally um, uh, dangerous, I think, effects on, on the social fabric. And uh, we need to understand what those are and figure out what we're going to do about it. So this emphasis that I'm placing on ship shipmate self. This is not just about, you know, getting tested before you go into the school building or the college campus or getting vaccinated before you go to school. This is also about how do we participate in social media? How do we talk with each other? How do we uh, think about e each other? And, and uh, how do we interact with, with the rest of the world? Uh, I think we're going to need some commitment as societies to showing not just telling, not just preaching, showing the importance of protecting the ship. And protecting the ship means things like um, openness to uh, reasonable disagreement and uh, open discussion and tolerance of people who are somewhat different uh, from us and, and trust, enforcing notions of integrity. Here, I think science could be a good model one of the great things about the scientific community is we're very strict about not allowing people to remain in the community if they're dishonest, if they try and trick us, if they try and mislead us. And it doesn't matter if, if legally they could show that it wasn't exactly perjury, they just left some things out to mislead us. You do that in science, you just get kicked out. Nobody listens to you afterwards. And I think in all of our societies, we need to go back to emphasizing some of those things like the, the importance of personal integrity in our interactions with others, because that's the only way to actually rebuild trust. Let me just make a small pitch for theory. I think theory could help economists think more clearly about the dynamics of these norms, which are so important to uh, social progress. So the, those theories will have to be you know, disciplined by the kind of evidence that you and others can, can collect. But we do need to, as an intellectual matter, not just as a practical matter, think about how do we bring norms, values uh, into uh, our economic uh, analysis. Oh yeah, totally, and bring it into our market designs. And, and I mean, as you say, right, we need to design these innovations. We need to um, yeah, yeah. hear these uh, developments and, uh, yeah, and hopefully we will get out soon. So thank you so much. And, and I will now hand over to Alexis and Paul, you will get a number of more questions up here. Okay, all right. So there's some questions uh, really um, asking, how can we address politics and, and get them into the boat? And Julian is asking, if I assume that governments act rationally, some more, others less, why not more governments pushing for widespread practical testing with the goal of letting life return to normal and only mm -hmm. isolating those that are infected? I, you know, one thing that I tell myself is it, it, it takes time to change a consensus. It change, takes time to change policy. So um, I'm, I'm not surprised that it's taken some time. And I think with those of us who want to make a change, we just have to have some, some persistence and willingness to keep pushing on these ideas. I, I also think in this case that the problem was not just the politicians, but there were many voices from the academic community who said you shouldn't test people who don't have symptoms. This was the big flaw in the, the public health response. There were reasons for this argument in the past. It may have worked well in the past, but it was just the wrong message today. So we partly have to have that conversation with our academic colleagues and say, in this circumstance, there's a very significant benefit 
to testing people who don't have system symptoms. The cost is lower, the benefit is high, we should, we should do it. So I've been finding a two front war where I'm trying to get the academics to accept this point, and then we can be more effective collectively when we speak to, to policymakers. There was also a question. You're quite confident, actually, the, that there will be a change, actually, in the in the political discussion, and uh, yeah, especially. Yeah, it's really US. it's really just a matter of timing. You know, it's a little bit like imagine that I were saying in you know the 1980s that you know we're, soon we're going to have uh, you know supercomputers in our pockets and we'll use these to have mobile communications that would be very important during an emergency. I mean, everybody was, ah, that's absurd. How can you ever have a supercomputer in your pocket? You know, and you're going to have a, like a power station in your other pocket to run the supercomputer. Uh, but, you know, um, what's going to happen is, is that, you know, seeing if the DNA of the virus is, is in a sample, this is kind of like just seeing if, uh, uh, if the word, um, you know, if the word refrigerator is in a newspaper. It's kind of like you take a newspaper, you, you chew it up in a blender, and then you just try and see, okay, is, is the word refrigerator in there somewhere? It's, a, it's an information processing task. We're getting really good at finding ways to just amplify all the cases that might say refrigerator and then see if it's there. And so we're, we're going to have very powerful tests very soon. And this will be important not just for this virus, but for the other viral pathogens we're going to meet down, down the road. So um, we're inevitably going to have a lot more testing capacity, and uh, it's just a question of, of when. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you mentioned the very powerful tests. Um, Astrid has an interesting question, and I think uh, for, for an economist like you, this is the perfect question. She says, is there a safe, zero, reliable test? She says, one problem over here is that tests show about 2% wrongly positive results. Yep, sure. This could send everybody quarantine, even if they're not infected. How yep. do you deal with this problem? Yeah, so this is a very good question. And this is part of this disagreement between the economists and or at least me and the, the public health people. The public health people are starting from the premise that anyone who gets a test result will believe it's absolute truth. When test results are not absolute truth, they're always subject to some errors. Now, what I, I as an economist say is, well, if you know it's not absolute truth, it can still teach you something. You know, I, I think about like measuring the length of a, of a table. You know, you never get the absolute truth in the measurement of the table. There's always some error in it, but you can still learn a lot by taking the measurement, and that might be enough to help you know if you can get it get it through the door. So if we just take the, the information we can learn from a test and use it appropriately, we get the benefit of more in, information, and we don't get the, the costs of, of misusing it. So I think... Um, the, the, the public health community and everybody needs to get used to the idea that knowing more is better than knowing less. Tests help us know more. And with that additional knowledge, we'll, we'll do a better job of containing this, this virus. And, and in terms of the specifics, I like false positives. Um, in Wuhan, they decided to test roughly 10 million people. Imagine they had just a 1% false positive rate. If I can do my math, that means 100,000 people would have gotten false positives. What they reported in Wuhan was they actually found 300 people who actually had the virus. So why did they get 300 instead of 100,000? Well, it's because they tested the people a second time. And if there's independent errors, the probability that you're going to get for the given person two false positives is, you know, is like the square of the probability that you get you know, one false positive. So there's ways to respond to weakness in the tests. And so all of these systems for proposing screening testing assume that you're going to do the, a second clinical diagnostic test to confirm and to start you know, the treatment and isolation options for, for the person. So we can get useful information out of imperfect tests. Maybe we take one more question to the testing strategies. Uh, okay. The question comes from Esther. And she's yeah. asking, what test strategy will catch most infected people at the earliest possible time for yep. individual isolation and quarantine to take effect? So she's yep. addressing the speed and yep. um, how can we... So, so, uh, so I think she's got the right idea here, which is that there are some super spreading events like maybe going to bars where the benefit is not that high, preventing them is, is expensive. Maybe we don't try to open up bars first. 
But there are other super spreading potential conditions like a classroom um, where uh, the benefit is high. So then we have to be sure we do something to keep the probability of infectious people coming in uh, low. The key there is frequent retesting. So you wanna test people on entry, but because here the problem is false negatives. There's some people where you might say they're, they're negative. I mean, for example, suppose they've already caught the virus, but it's such, such an early stage, they don't have very much you know, viral load and the test won't, won't pick it up. So they'll be infectious in two days, but they're not infectious today. This is kind of why places like Harvard are saying, well, you just test every, you know, every three days. So uh, frequent retesting is the way to get the, the prevalence down in a population. And then, you know, you should also be thinking about, you know, masks can limit the, the spread of these aerosols. Fresh air is, is like the miracle cure-all. Um, you know, if you've got to have uh, conditions where people are closely packed to, uh, you know, have a, a seminar course uh, or a classroom uh, discussion, um, it's very important to have the windows open or enough ventilation coming through so you don't have these aerosols that, that linger. So the combination of testing frequently will get the probability down, but it's nothing is perfect here. You want to combine that with masks, if appropriate, and things like fresh, uh, fresh air and ventilation, which um, will substantially reduce the, the spread um, if somebody does uh, come into those, uh, those settings. So maybe we move a little bit further with the questions um, to behavioral economics. And um, one interesting question here comes from, from Peter. Um, and he says, what are the best behavioral methods uh, to convince the doubters that they protect the ship? So he's addressing to your picture of the ship, yeah. that they protect the ship as well. So the yeah. ones that doubt that there is a danger. Uh, so I think, I think part of what, helps a lot is people tend to be conformists. So if you can create conditions where most people are doing the right thing, then others will conform and a higher probability does the right thing. So it's a kind of a, a virtuous circle where if you create those conditions as more people do the right thing, uh, the more that becomes normative, like the right thing, not just the, the usual thing. Um, of course, that dynamic can run backwards if a lot of people are protesting in very visible ways the use of masks, that may reinforce to other people that they shouldn't use masks. So we need to use a little bit of, uh, of power. And, and I think the right kind of power here is not shaming, it's not fining, it's not you know, incarcerating, but it's like denying options to people if they're not willing to um, do the things that, that help others. So then if they want to get into the classroom, if they want to get on, on campus, they want to go to the restaurant, um, you know, they've got to do things like get tested and show that you were tested recently before you can, you can go in. And then people who may just do it because they want to go to the restaurant may find that everybody else is doing it. And then they start to believe it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. So um, again, you got to watch the facts here because some policies can lead to a backlash. But in other important cases, saying that you need to do this to participate has actually uh, created a, a positive cycle that helps instantiate a, a, a new norm. Yeah, and actually, let me give the, the example that I think is the, the most optimistic one, which is smoking. You know, there would have been a lot of people who would say before, well, I've got a right to smoke in a bar and I, you know, this is your problem. If you don't want to be around smoke, don't come to the bar. When we started saying it's illegal to smoke in a bar, um, it didn't really matter in a legal sense. It's not like we gave out a lot of tickets to, you know, for people who are smoking in bars, or we didn't send anybody to jail for it. But what did happen is the people in the bar who didn't smoke started thinking, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't have to put up with the smoking. And they would, they would scowl at somebody who was smoking, or they'd ask the bar manager, you know, he shouldn't be in here and be smoking. So a change in the law led to a sharp change in behavior and a, and, a, and a big change in norms that has helped protect everybody's health. I'd like to have two more questions. And the one is, is, is addressing you very personally. And I think you, there was some answer there, but, but I, I really want to read it. Liliana asks, oh, sorry, Professor Romo, but this selfishness regarding testing is the extension of the individual utility, individual self-interest capitalism promotes. 
are you revisiting your ideological standing as a result of this brutal field study brought about by COVID-19? And she has another question she asks, in a nutshell, will COVID-19 make you into a European Social Democrat? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's a good question. Um, there's actually a, a factual record here that one can look at. I published a review of two books in the, in the publication Foreign Affairs. I think it came out in February. Um, it's behind a paywall, but I can, I can try and get a copy on my um, website. So back in February, before the pandemic hit, these two books were saying that economics has done great harm in the United States. And I said in my review, we need to take these books very seriously, in particular because they, you know, what may have happened is, is by focusing so much attention on self-interest, economists have, um, have really undermined um, uh, effective functioning of society. Um, the, the evidence that was most persuasive to me about this was actually the evidence that life expectancy in the United States had, had stopped uh, increasing, and it even had started falling in, in recent years. I, I had always pointed to increases in life expectancy as this key indicator of human progress, and something was going wrong in the United States in the sense that we stopped you know, lifting life expectancy, like the average number of years that uh, people would, would live. So I was already uh, predisposed towards this. And um, I, I don't like using the, the word ideology because I never know quite what it means. But, it, but it, it was a change where I started to ask questions that I had not asked before. And, and as I, I said to some people afterwards, it was really, it was a very troubling um, experience to write this review because, um, you know, it was raising the question whether the discipline to which I had devoted my whole career has on balance done more harm uh, than good. And, um, you know, I think, I think there's some evidence that that's true, but, uh, but how do you respond? Well, it's time to make a change and it's time to fix it so that we as scholars actually start contributing positively. So I was predisposed to this kind of thinking already when the pandemic hit and um, I, I think really reinforced it. So the, the last question, actually, to go back to the to your quote, to the Great Depression, um, Michael says, isn't there an opportunity in this crisis so that the crisis is not wasted for a concept like beyond GDP? And the second question I want to add is, is um, the question, isn't the vaccine going to bring back stability? So is there a new normal state, whatever this is, coming as soon as... Uh, let me take those in, in, in reverse order. Um, you know, as Nora was suggesting, I think we're going to face a real problem with getting people to take the, the vaccine once it's introduced. So I think that's going to be a long, um, uh, a long process. Uh, so no, I don't think it's going to be a, a miracle cure. And, and moreover, um, this, this virus is known as SARS-CoV-2. That's because there was a SARS-CoV and there's going to be a SARS-CoV-3 and 4. And, you know, we might get better at quickly developing vaccines, but in parallel, um, we'll need to have the ability to test for and identify all the new viral pathogens that, um, uh, that we'll see. And, and one of the facts that emerged from the, this, this pandemic was it spread first in the developed countries. The developed system of travel and inter, you know, interaction, um, economic integration is going to make it easier for viruses to spread. So pandemics are probably going to get more common rather than less common. So the vaccine is not a cure-all. It'll be part of a broader defense system that we have. In terms of the, you know, an opportunity here, um, I, I think there's there is a, a kind of a possibility that official statistics like GDP that we focus on could be adjusted to have better um, measures that guide us in, in the right direction. Um, I, I think in many ways, the key to this is to have good measurement. You know, we need to know something like, not just, you know, is this drug working? Is that drug working? You know, uh, but also, What's, what's happening to life expectancy for the entire population? So we'll need many kinds of measures that can assess 
what is happening to the, the quality of life. And out of those, that raw material, I, we have a chance, I think, to create a better kind of summary indicator of is a society making, uh, making progress. But, but I think e even beyond this, um, this notion of like better indicators, there is this, I think, commitment to the facts. We need scientists who are committed to facts. Um, we need uh, processes that lead to the uncovering of, of the facts. And, you know, I was, I was waffling a little bit about like this issue of ideology. I think part of what has changed for me is, is not just uh, something in the realm of ideology, but it's also just a fact. Economists said, not just it's good to be selfish, but they said people are selfish. This is the fact. But when you look at the data and the evidence, people are not just selfish. My, my colleague, Jonathan Haidt, says that we're, we're selfish sometimes, but we're groupish other times. There are times when we really care about what matter, what the well-being of, of the group. So it's the facts as much as anything, which I think um, mean that it's possible to have something that doesn't look like just, you know, capitalism, you know, uh, red and tooth and claw. Um, we can have group uh, structures, group systems that, that produce better, better outcomes for us all. So um, I, I'm most comfortable and can see myself contributing most by just driving home again and again this fact that we have to, or this principle that we have to let the facts guide the discussion. And one of the very encouraging facts is that people can be uh, kind of encouraged or evolve towards a state where they really do care about the well-being of, of the group. And we need to just uh, encourage and uh, uh, support that natural tendency. So thank you very much for answering all these questions. Um, there are many more. Please apologize all the ones of you um, who, yeah. who did not have the possibility to ask them. Um, but I uh, want to hand over back to uh, Nora to uh, make a short summary. Well, thank you for uh, being the, the, the one who summarized yeah. these questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Alexis. I mean, you dig through all these many, many super interesting questions. I just got the chance to read. So yeah, just as a very quick wrap, wrap up, I think we all learned so much from you. Thank you so much, dear Paul. Um, yeah, possibly we need to um, add more facts to the math that we all yeah. do. And, and one fact is humans are not only selfish, they are also social. So I believe yeah. wearing a mask is also good for your own health, right? So don't forget yeah. that. Don't yeah, be exactly. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> another fact is that the way to be happy is not to be selfish. And that there's evidence that, that supports this. It's not, I'm not, this isn't preaching. This is just the facts. Yeah. yeah, and maybe we get, you know, in this sense, better out of the crisis that we have learned that this matters too. And maybe we had forgotten about this a little bit too much um, before. Yeah. Um, and then I feel um, from what you said, um, of course, we need the testing, but there's also this German concept. And I feel it should really be more extended all over the world of the, you know, the German beer garden that could be also helping in the way out, right? Because people mm -hmm. gather outside and have their beers there yep. and maybe that's a well, better alternative for the Mars, not only at Harvard campus but in many yep. many places that's right like yep if you want to have a party on campus it better be outdoors and you know <laughs> you better make sure there's a good good fan running too so. <laughs> yeah party like the Germans yeah yeah I like that party like the Germans that should be the, <laughs> the new slogan on campus <laughs> thank you so much dear Paul well, and let me let me just say, um, I'm not quite sure how, but people will figure out a way. Keep this conversation going. Um, those of you who had questions, who didn't get a chance to participate, you know, through this, through the network here and through your other activities, keep this conversation going because this is the conversation uh, that will really determine, I think, the future of, of our species. <laughs>